Last night, I couldn't sleep again. I set my alarm for 3.30, hoping I'd actually sleep, but instead I stayed up, looking out the window, watching time pass till my alarm actually went off. We had to be at the bus station in Zagreb before 8 a.m. I grabbed a bite to eat, we'll call that breakfast, then we got on the bus for that 12-hour ride to Rome. I hate that feeling, knowing I went to the washroom, but scared I'll need to go again as soon as the bus leaves. No one wants to be the one with the weak-ass bladder raising their hand up while hiding behind the seat to ask the bus driver to pull over. From the highway, we passed by some of Croatia's coastal towns like Trisat and Rijeka, Opatia, Pula, then through Slovenia, stopping every now and then to stretch, unload, reload, and have a cigarette. As we passed through Umbria, Italy, the people on the bus fumbled to get out of their seats. Amidst the oohs and ahs and camera flashing, I got out of my seat to see a city which seems to rise out of the earth towards the sky. I know I've been on this bus for a while now, so I rub my eyes to make sure I ain't seeing shit. Orvieto, the city in the sky, sits on the flat summit of a large beauty of volcanic tuff. We get off the tour bus and take two separate buses up this winding road to the top. As soon as you step off the bus, you're dwarfed by this massive Orvieto Cathedral. According to Wikipedia, November 15, 1290, Pope Nicholas IV laid the cornerstone for the present building and dedicated it to the Assumption of the Virgin, a feast for which the city had a long history of special devotion. The tour guide, Yashko, said that Pope Leo XIII described the cathedral as the golden lily of Italian cathedrals. It was inspired by the miracle of a Baslena in 1263. The miracle, locals tell us, is that blood is said to have dripped from the consecrated host onto the corporal, a small cloth where the host and the chalice rest during the canon of the mass. We didn't have time to go inside, but there is a casket that encases the altar cloth spotted with the blood. There is also all kinds of underground passageways and wells that lead deep into the volcanic tuff. The church is striped in white taverntine and greenish black basalt in narrow bands, similar to other cathedrals of Siena and central Italian cathedrals of that era. Yashko was telling us that the 3D images running up the face of the church, like hieroglyphics, tells the story of Christ. Two things we learned very quickly about our tour guide Yashko. Not only is he very passionate about history, he's a walking encyclopedia of information. Awesome. Only problem is, if the tour bus was booked in Zagreb, yes, he can speak English, but for the tour, he speaks in Croatian. Therefore, I have no clue what's going on. Second, he moves like a general with a cask loaded with espresso. So welcome to boot camp tour guides. It doesn't matter how hot, it doesn't matter how dehydrated, it doesn't matter if you gotta pee, it don't matter how old you are, it don't matter if your leg is broken, it don't matter if you're dead. Dude moves like the wind, so I needed to move my ass in order to keep up. Orvieto was like a test to see how well we do in Rome. Many times I would look up and Yashka would be almost out of sight. Shit. I love the way Italians talk, and I love the way they express themselves with their hands. It's like poetry in motion. Italian words have an end in vowels as opposed to ex-Yugoslavia where vowels are in short demand. Words like Hrvatska and Serbia are according to English language missing vowels which make them difficult to say. Orvieto was a pretty big town, and even though General Yashko has given us some free time to explore, he runs a tight ship. So considering all the turns and alleys we can easily get lost in, we try to see as much as we can without straying too far from the pack. Now, I could be wrong, but I feel the people here just conform to the tourist activity. I really don't think they went out of their way to attract people here. But stories of incredible wine, oh, and blood coming out of a cup and spilling on an altar cloth, and by the way, we have the cloth on display, might just bring a person or two. I feel like the people here just said, well, if they're gonna come, we might as well sell them something.
Italian ingenuity. I love it. So I've noticed a lot of ceramic vendors in stores, so I'm assuming they're known for that as well. The only problem is they're on the Euro here, so things can get pretty pricey pretty quick. And this store is a beautiful ceramic, coffee shops, super restaurants, and medieval weaponry. Good luck trying to smuggle that shit past Canadian customs. As I walk around, I can't help but wonder why such a grand place like this isn't in your typical Italian trip brochure. Orvieto is one of those beautiful towns sitting high above the land in the clouds. It's probably overlooked, hidden in the shadow of cities like Rome, Florence, Venice, the Vatican. But Umbria is known for its white wine. And from the popes of the Middle Ages to modern Italians, Ovrieto Abracato has been the ideal dessert wine. No wonder everyone around here seems happy and relaxed. I wonder if the green hills and pastures are reminiscent of those in Tuscany. Tuscany, I think, is where most of the wine comes from. But I heard about 15% of the wine in the Italian market comes from here. Oh shit, time's up. We need to meet General Yashko at the bottom of the hill. And with all the buses heading down, Goga decides to walk. Well, I guess walking down is better than walking up. But with all the catching up to our tour guide I've recently been introduced to, I'm exhausted. Don't ask. I'm not sure exactly what that sculpture's about. When the bus gets back on the highway, we all watch as Orvieto disappears back into the clouds. And in the next six hours or so, we'll be in Rome. Thank you.